There were few pieces of album artwork as instantly recognisable as the Velvet Underground and Nico's seminal debut record. Now a part of this is of course down to the innovative brilliance of the record itself. The genius of this simple yet strikingly effective design cannot be underplayed. So what is the story behind the most iconic banana in rock and roll? and the artist who created it, Andy Warhol. Warhol was born in 1928 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to two Slovakian immigrants, Andrzej and Julia Warhola. He graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in 1949 and moved to New York to become a commercial artist. While this was a successful time for Warhol, winning many awards during the course of the 50s for his whimsical style, using his own blotted line technique and rubber stamps to create his drawings, it wouldn't be until the early 60s that he became a superstar. In 1961, he debuted the concept of pop art, which were paintings that focused on mass-produced commercial goods, such as his 1962 Campbell soup cans, a painting I had even hung in my bedroom for many years when I was younger. This expanded into celebrity portraits in strange garish colours such as those of Marilyn Monroe and Mick Jagger or the legendary Eight Elvises which sold for $100 million in 2008. In 1964, Warhol opened his own art studio in a warehouse called The Factory. It was both a productive art studio with John Cale of the Velvet Underground remarking that it wasn't called the factory for nothing. It was where the assembly line for the silk screens happened. While one person was making a silk screen, somebody else would be filming a screen test. Every day, something new. And a cultural hotspot full of many of New York City's outsiders, wannabe fashion models, speed freaks, poets, movie makers, all sorts. Lou Reed would later write about the people from the factory in the song Walk on the Wild Side. Jackie is just speeding away Thought she was Jim Dean for a day Then I guess she had to crash Valium would have helped that patch I said, hey babe, take a walk on the wild side I said, In 1965, the Velvet Underground had a stable gig playing every fortnight at the Café Bazaar, a tourist bar with exotic drinks, and it was this that led to Andy Warhol becoming involved. Paul Morrissey, an avant-garde film director and collaborator of Warhol's, had seen the Velvet Underground play at the Café Bazaar and thought there was money to be made. He suggested to the band that Warhol be made their manager in name only, and Morrissey suggested to Warhol the Warhol put his movies in a rock and roll context. When Andy first visited the cafe and saw the Velvet Underground play, he was immediately hypnotised. The Velvet's lyrical themes around drugs and sex and their strange droning sounds immediately appealed to Andy as art rock, so he agreed to become the manager. While Warhol was the manager in name, it was Morrissey who really took the reins. He found Lou Reed to be too uncomfortable of a performer and not a strong enough frontman. So, much to the band leaders Lou Reed and John Cale's discomfort, they agreed to allow Morrissey to bring Nico into the band. Nico was a successful German model with an unconventional voice, but Nico provided strange beauty to the band's discordant and chaotic music, both in her un-American beauty and her soaring voice. The Velvets were thus positioned for their first real collaboration of Warhol, the exploding plastic inevitable, a multimedia art installation with the band accompanying a 70 minute silent black and white film called The Velvet Underground and Nika, a symphony of sound. This simple idea ended up growing wilder and more ambitious, with kaleidoscopic images and dancers entering the fray. Warhol said of the exploding plastic inevitable that we all knew something revolutionary was happening, we just felt it. 
Things couldn't look this strange and new without some barrier being broken. While well, this project allowed them unbridled creative freedom in the Velvet's avant-garde accompaniments to the film, what they really wanted was to just record the songs they had already written. Andy decided that the album must remain untainted by corporate interference when it came time to make it. So, they agreed to record the album first and then afterwards sell it to a record label. Consequently, there wasn't much in the way of funds for recording it, so it was recorded in a cheap studio with only four microphones available, with Warhol as the producer. Though, what it says on the sleeve that Warhol was the producer, he didn't really contribute anything musically to the album, but as Lou puts it... The advantage of having Andy Warhol as a producer was that because he was Andy Warhol, they left everything in its pure state. Which, and they would say, is that okay, Mr. Warhol? And he'd say, oh, yeah. And so they didn't change anything. And so right at the very beginning, we experienced what it was like to be in the studio and record things our way and have essentially total freedom. The record company never listened to the records in the first place, so they came out exactly like they'd been made. However, he certainly did contribute the artwork the iconic banana. Now, looking upon the original vinyl cover is quite a different experience to looking at its CD counterpart. On CD, the image is simply that of a yellow banana with the text Peel Slowly and See written on it. And you cannot interact with it in the same way as the original vinyl record cover. You see, on vinyl, the text is meaningful. You peel back physically the yellow banana, which is just a sticker, to find a pink, fleshy banana underneath. And it's really important, I think, in understanding this cover, to understand how the cover's not merely a two-dimensional depiction of a yellow banana, but is an interactive form of artwork. Now, the difference here between the CD experience and the original vinyl experience reminds me a bit of another of Andy Warhol's work, the infamous Brillo boxes. Warhol and his team built hundreds of replicas of the commercial brand Brillo's steel wall boxes. So these were just ordinary plywood cubes, which were silk screens to simulate the branded boxes. The Brillo boxes that Warhol created are a facsimile of the original, but yet there is something quite different about them to the original, divorced from that original context. And this is the same, I argue, for the cover of the Velvet Underground's debut. The iconic banana, the yellow figure of the Velvet Underground, has become divorced from the original artwork, as if that's all the cover ever was but there is far more than meets the eye. We tend to have a, a reasonable expectation that an album cover corresponds in some way with the music, whether that's just by simply showing a picture of the band, or by encapsulating the sound of the album in a picture. This is why Cannibal Corpse have bloody brutal artwork, why King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard have trippy psychedelic artwork, the art is meant to help sell the music. So what does a banana have to do with the Velvet Underground? Since a humble piece of fruit saying peel slowly and see with the artist's name signed at the bottom hardly screams experimental innovative rock music. Well, there are a number of theories. The first is perhaps the most obvious, and that is the banana as sexual imagery. I mean look at it. If that doesn't scream phallic symbol, then I'm not sure what does. The connotations of the fruit alone can easily be read in this way, and then let alone when you slowly peel it, you get the pink fleshy part. Hmm. I mean, the Velvet Underground was certainly involved in sex subcultures. They were very active in the kinky New York 
subculture of the time. Their name, in fact, comes from a book by the author Michael Lay talking about sexual paraphernalia, things like S&M whips and costumes and all of that stuff, which was, well, rather taboo in the mid-60s. And that's a topic which Venus in Fairs covers rather nicely. Shiny, shiny, shiny boots of leather With flesh, girl, child in the dark The second common theory you see kind of floating about online is that perhaps the banana was a drug reference. Again, this is another subculture very familiar to the band. I'm sure no one who's heard the Velvet Underground's debut record will be shocked to hear that heroin is about drugs or I'm waiting for the man. But what do bananas have to do with drugs? Well, in the late 60s, there was this rumour that hidden in bananas was the chemical Bananadine, which allowed its users to have a psychedelic experience. The rumour became more widely known when the artist Country McDonald of the band Country Joe and the Fish, I'd never heard of them before either, they announced that smoking bananas would cause a psychedelic effect while passing banana peel into the audience. And now this recipe even made it into William Powell's infamous The Anarchist Cookbook in the drugs section. Now, before you go to your local supermarket, buy a whole bunch of bananas, get your mates around and start trying to smoke them, you might not be surprised to hear that Bananadine has never actually been isolated as a chemical compound by researchers, and there's been no observations and effect of smoking bananas other than a placebo effect in those who believe this rumour. Though, the older gentleman watching this video may be interested to know that banana peel does have one effect, which is decreasing enlarged prostate glands. It's not quite as glamorous though. So do I think this rumour really had any impact on Warhol's design for the cover of the Velvet Underground? No, not really. Mainly because, while the album was released in 1967 when the Banana Dine rumour began, it was recorded, finished, artwork and music and all by the end of 1965, two years before Country Joe revealed this whole banana drug craze thing. Me, I tend to find the sexual interpretation to be the most plausible, though when you're talking about Warhol and sex, it's certainly a difficult topic. He was um, a bit of an enigma in that regard. You have some people saying that he was asexual, others saying wildly the opposite. So. I'm no biographer of Warhol myself, so I'm unsure. But one thing I can be quite sure about that's worth remembering and bearing in mind when looking at why the cover is a banana is Warhol's love of common, basic imagery. And in 2017, the origin of the banana was discovered. Warhol had not created the original banana himself. It was repurposed from the, a logo on a metal ashtray manufacturer. So perhaps this is one of those times where the reason of it being a banana may just be because, well, why not have a banana? It's a striking piece of commercial imagery, something Warhol loved to play with. You wouldn't think that a banana on an album cover would become so controversial as to spark two separate lawsuits. But indeed, the Velvet Underground's debut album did this. Though the first lawsuit doesn't actually relate to the banana, but it relates to something we haven't looked at yet, the back cover. Yeah, the back cover was designed by ACR Lehman, who decided on portrait pictures of the band with kaleidoscopic light taken by Hugo and a picture of them performing with the exploding plastic inevitables taken by manager Paul Morrissey. And if you look carefully, you'll see behind the band a face. The face of the actor Eric Emerson, who appears in many of Warhol's films around that time. Now you see, when the album came out, Emerson had recently been released from a drug possession charge and was kind of broke. So as a result of his money woes, he threatened to sue over the unauthorized use of his image unless he was paid. 
So instead of complying with Emerson's demands, the record label MGM simply halted the record's production until his face could be airbrushed out, and copies that had been printed with Emerson's face were just sold with large black stickers covering it on the back of the package. More recently, there was another lawsuit in 2012. Now this one gets a little complex, so try and bear with me. So the Velvet Underground Partnership is the legal group who represents the Velvet Underground, and that includes John Cale and Lou Reed, what well, Lou Reed at the time. And they sued the Andy Warhol Foundation, the foundation in charge of Andy Warhol's paintings and pictures, etc., for copyright infringement. So the Warhol Foundation had just licensed the banana design to a company called InCase Designs for use on a line of iPhone and iPad cases but not as something associated with the Velvet Underground, necessarily, just as a piece of Andy Warhol's work. So, the Velvet Underground partners were not very happy about not being consulted about this deal. Now, it's a rather strange case, because the Velvet Underground partners, they actually recognised that the cover doesn't belong to them, but they argued that it also doesn't belong to the Andy Warhol Foundation, and that the Warhol Foundation can't just willy-nilly license it however they want without the Velvet Underground Partnership's permission so as to not cause band or brand confusion. And then the Warhol Foundation claimed they were being nice by not having sued the Velvet Underground for reproducing it on reissues of the Velvet Underground's debut album without their permission, and blah blah blah, etc, etc, etc. The case was dropped in 2013, and it was settled out of court with a confidential agreement. So, that is the story of Rock's most iconic piece of fruit. Well, one of Rock's most iconic pieces of fruit, at least. This has been the Album Man. Thank you so much for watching, and as usual, long live rock and roll.